Today we are continuing in our sermon series, uh, The Real Jesus, which is interesting. I hadn't thought of it, but the, uh, the logo with all the Jesuses, and then there's one that's a different color, and then the name, it kind of implies that there are fake Jesuses, maybe Jesuses that we made up. Um, maybe so. I don't know. We'll talk about that today, I think. Um, two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus, is he passive or a visionary? And I hope what you heard that Sunday is that Jesus is a visionary. He does have a vision. He wants to change the world. He, he wants to establish his kingdom of love, and he needs you to be a part of that. He needs all of us uh, to, to be a part of that for his plan to succeed. Last week, I was somewhere warm, but I hope what you heard was a, a sermon on uh, was Jesus a rule follower or a rule breaker? And I hope that the message that you, you heard uh, last Sunday was that Jesus sometimes would break the rules because he had a bigger rule, a deeper rule, an underlying rule, which was he was going to care for the people and love them and do God's work. So I'm not suggesting that you go break uh, rules, but sometimes it's just important for us to remember that, that people, loving people, that's, uh, that's what life is about here on earth. Today we have um, an interesting question that um, uh, someone was surprised we were talking about this, but um, uh, the, the question is Jesus. Was he just a man or was he the son of God? If you'll stand for our scripture reading. This is the story of the transfiguration from Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll build three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. Peter wanted to stay on the mountain. You ever have an experience with God and you just want to stay on the mountain? Jesus says, no, we can't stay up here. we got to go back down there. Why? Because that's where the people are. That's where life takes place, down in the valleys. So, you know, we have, um, we have mountaintop experiences sometimes, but we can't stay there. We've got we've to go back to where people live and share what God has done in our hearts. So there's this question, is it shocking? Is Jesus just a man, or is he the Son of God? I had a dream last week. I dream all the time. Uh, crazy things we dream. And I was getting ready to start this sermon, and I announced the title, and someone came, and they were sitting right over there. It was a dream person, so it isn't anybody that I know. But as I, as I uh, read the title, Jesus, just a man, or Son of God, I could tell they were mortified that we were even talking about this, as if we're not supposed to ask questions. And so the first thing I want to say to you is um, I don't think God is offended by questions that we might ask. I think the best decisions we make are decisions that we get a chance to think about and talk through. I don't think Jesus was offended by by questions. Time and time again in the scripture, we see people going up to Jesus and asking him all kinds of things. And you remember when the, the, the uh, people wanted to bring their children to Jesus and the disciples said, no, no children. Why? Because if the children get there, it's going to get crazy. I mean, who knows what they're going to ask? Who knows what they're going to do? Jesus says, bring it, bring it. And then, of course, in um, uh, John 3, Nicodemus 
he comes to Jesus at night and he's got a whole bunch of, of questions. I personally am going to believe in a God that takes questions. Uh, I, I, I think that, that it's scriptural and I think that is the only way for us to make real heartfelt commitments to him is when we can ask our questions. Maybe you're, you're here today and you've never questioned any of these things. Uh, maybe you grew up in the church and you've just always believed that Jesus is the Son of God and you've never had a doubt one. And, and if that's you, I say, great, congratulations. Then there's the rest of most of the people that I know. And you know, um, it's easy for us, for our hearts to grow callous. This happens to us. And if you're around something too much, sometimes you forget the beauty of it. That's why we're snippy with our family, because we've forgotten how special that they are, you know? And folks that are around church a lot, sometimes you just sort of fall into a taking it for granted. Church staff and pastors in particular have to ask themselves from time to time, uh, why am I doing this? What do I believe in the very bottom of my soul? And, and so I'm just glad that God is not uh, offended by our, our questions. I would tell you today that um, if Jesus is, is just a man, by the way, uh, this, today this is what I believe. This is my opinion. Um, maybe every sermon's my opinion, right? I don't know. Probably. But if Jesus is just a man, um, then all the missions that we're doing, they're just good works. If Jesus is just a man, then um, I'm not sure where to turn to for guidance in this world. I'm not sure where to find direction. I'm not sure where to find help with my problems. I'm not sure where to find care and consolation. And if Jesus is, is just a man, the world suddenly seems short on meaning and purpose. And if Jesus is just a man, I don't know how the relationship with God is restored because we are still in our sins. Well, uh, my parents told me growing up to believe in Jesus, and we didn't really have a choice. It was just expected, and the church I went to, um, you weren't allowed to ask questions, so they taught us what to believe, and we, we believed that I, I would say to you today, you can't force anyone to believe in Jesus. You can't force the Christian faith on anyone. It just doesn't work very well. There's an interesting story from Vietnam in 1963. There was a coup, and President Diem was overthrown, and then while in protective custody of the people that overthrew him, he was assassinated. And we hear about these things, we read about these things, and we think, oh, it's, it's this or that, or we don't know really politically what's going on in the world. But there's a backstory on that that's kind of interesting. President Diem's brother was the Catholic Archbishop in Vietnam, and he um, uh, pressured the president to try to lift up the Christian faith and push down the Buddhist faith by outlawing several um, important Buddhist celebrations. So all the Buddhists rose up, and there was a, a big national uprising, and the end of the result of that was a, a president was deposed and a president was killed because he allowed uh, one faith to try to be forced on another. You can't force people to choose Jesus. Um, I want people to come, that come to our church to just feel very comfortable at wherever they're at because to me the very best decisions are made without coercion. In fact, sometimes the very best decisions you make uh, are at home or in the car. I love to hear those stories because there's no preacher involved. It's just you and God. It's God doing what God knows how to do. Uh, so these things can't be forced. All of us must decide for our, ourselves. Well, um, is Jesus a man or is he the son of God? I, gosh, which Jesus? You talk to different Christians, you get lots of different pictures of Jesus. And I tell you, there is a Jesus out there, and he's not very happy with you. There is a Jesus that Christians tell me about. He's not happy with you. He's always looking over your shoulder. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't please him, it seems, and, and you're always disappointing him in some way or another. There are some Jesuses that some Christians describe that sound very, very human. And to me, 
those aren't the Son of God Jesuses. But when I read in Scripture uh, uh, what Jesus is doing, what he actually does, and when I, when I, when I hear his teaching, when I, when I think about the things that he taught his followers, it feels good. It feels holy. It feels amazing. It feels godly. And so we think of the teachings of Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as, as yourself. Turn the other cheek. Go the second mile. Love your enemies. I mean, these are the kind of things that make me feel and believe down in my heart that Jesus isn't just a man. He has a teaching that is beyond human. It is godly through and, and through. Well, our choice about who we think Jesus is is uh, an, a choice that impacts eternity, you know, how we will spend eternity, but it also has a big impact on how we live now. There are people um, uh, in our world today that would tell you they're agnostic or atheist. In fact, I hear from members all the time that are, I'm worried about my son, I'm worried about my daughter, I'm worried about my brother, my sister, so-and-so, they say they are not a believer. Um, they're agnostic or atheist. The largest, the fastest growing religious group in America, none of the above. People that say, I have no religious affiliation. And I talk to these folks, you know, a lot of them, they just don't believe in the church. They just don't believe in the heavy stuff that some pastor laid on them. And there's groups popping up all over the country. Maybe you've heard about some of these. There was an article in the, in the paper not too long ago. Uh, for example, there's a group in Kansas City called Oasis. And it's kind of like a church, except there's no dogma. There's no guilt. There's no heavy. There's no arm twisting. Um, you, you go to the place. You park your car. There's greeters. I don't know if they have green shirts. I've not been there. But <laughs> there's greeters. There's coffee and donuts. Uh, there's music that you can sit down and kind of enjoy, and uh, then there's a talk. They say it's kind of like a TED talk, and after the service, there's a table where you can sign up to make a pledge. That's pretty churchy, right? And then they do kindness. They do mission work of such, and it's a place where people can have a church and a fellowship without all the heavy things that have been brought along the way. And you know, I, I understand that, you know, the church has been tough on people over the years, but I wonder what it would be like to go to bed at night. And I don't know about you, but I think a very telling time of the day is when you lay your head on your pillow. That's when things start to slow down, and you can ask yourself about how things are going and what's going on. It's when I worry less about all the other things that I can't do anything more about today. And I tend to find my soul when I'm laying my head on the pillow at night. And I wonder what it must be like for people that don't believe in God or don't believe in Jesus. And they can tell everybody they're an atheist and whatnot, but at night when they're alone, in the very bottom of their heart of hearts, I feel for them because something is missing as I see the world. If you don't believe, there's something more than me. I think innately inside of us, uh, there is this awareness that there's something more in this world than us. What do we think when we go to the redwood trees? Wow, wow, there's something more in this world than me. What do we think when we go to the Grand Canyon? <laughs> Wow, there's something more than just me. You stand at the beach, see the vastness of the ocean, watch a baby being born, there's this, wow, there's something more in this life than me. I think part of life is a journey for us to find and discover who is, what is that something that's, that's bigger than me, because I think we want to be connected to that something that's bigger than me. There's a story about a four-year-old boy who's running around the house on, on Saturday and his mom is home and she's cleaning up and doing Saturday things and she goes from one room to the next and she's 
uh, vacuuming, dusting, picking up the kids' toys, and he's just underfoot. He's just following her around. Now, it's been a long time since we had kids do that at my house, but we've had a dog sometimes, and it's like, dude. Well, the mom finally looks at the kid and says, what? What do you want? It's a good mama tone, right? What is it? And the boy says, Mom, I just want to be where you are. I just want to be with you. And I think down in the bottom of our hearts, in our soul, if we can find that place through all the busyness of this world, there is a deep desire in the life of most human beings to be connected to that God who is bigger than we are. So, here's this transfiguration. Uh, What's going on? Jesus takes some guys up the mountain. Jesus spent a lot of time uh, not just healing and doing good, but trying to help the disciples understand who he was and what his plan was. And, you know, they started from zero. You know, they, they, they see him, and he's a man. He looks like a man. And somehow, along the way, Jesus has to help them get it. So uh, the story today is a big part of helping the disciples to get it. But there's another uh, interesting story a few chapters ahead in, or behind in Matthew 16, where the disciples are with Jesus up in northern Galilee at a place called Caesarea Philippi. Those of you that went on the Holy Land trip a few years ago will remember this. Beautiful, calm, trees, uh, brook, stream, there's a... um, the water comes out of the ground. Uh, it's, a, it's a spring. Thank you. You knew I was. Lo- you knew I couldn't find the word. Thank you. Uh, it's in a country that's kind of dry. It's a wonderful place. There are lots of Greek and Roman ruins there because everyone went there to find rest and 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 wholeness. You know, creation speaks to our souls, doesn't it? And so Jesus is there with the disciples, and and I imagine him uh, under a shade tree and and the sound of the brook in the background, and he says to them. What are people saying about me? Well, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Elijah, some say you're another prophet. And Jesus asks them the million dollar question. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, in one of Peter's good moments, God bless Peter, he gives us all all of the broken, imperfect people in the world love to read about the disciple Peter because he gets it wrong a lot. Uh, but this time he gets it right. He says, who are you? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus says, it's great, Peter. God has revealed this to you. Now I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the, the chief priests. I'm, I'm going to be put to death and after three days rise again. And then Peter gets it wrong. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no for suffering, no for death, no for difficulty. You're our leader. You're our friend. You can't go and die. I don't want it to be that way. And what does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. You have in mind the things of man instead of the things of God. Peter, you've opted for your preference and comfort instead of what God really wants to do. And the little light bulb goes off in my head, and I wonder if, if, if Jesus could come talk to us like he talked to Peter. How many times would he want to say to me, or to you, or to us, get that stuff behind me? You're thinking about your preference and comfort. You're thinking about the way that men and women want it to go when God has something else important going on. So they're, uh, they're on their way to the Mount of the Transfiguration, and uh, Jesus leads them up the mountain. It's a group of three or four of them, and uh, when they get to the top, he begins to glow and appear as their Elijah and and Moses. This is very, very significant. This this would be like if we went to Washington, D.C., and suddenly found ourselves standing next to George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. This is a big deal. There is a big message on the table. And Peter gets it wrong, and it's almost funny. Hey, Jesus, uh, Moses, Elijah, you, let's build some shelters. Let's put walls on them, maybe some green metal for the roof, 
hey, we could even organize a church. I could be the pastor. The things humans think about. And it's interesting, right as Peter is babbling, the glowing cloud comes down, and the voice of God interrupts Peter's voice. How odd would that feel? To be babbling about something, and God's audible voice interrupts your babbling. Peter, they end up face down on the ground, understandably so. Here's Moses, the most important leader in Jewish history, who led the people uh, out of slavery through the wilderness, gave them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, led them to the edge of the, of the Promised Land. This is the most important leader in, in Jewish history. And here's Elijah, the most important prophet in, in Jewish uh, history. And, and God is making a statement to these disciples. It's not about Moses. It's not about Elijah. The guy, this other guy, this is my son, the glowing one. That's my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. Listen to him. And so on this mountaintop, in the midst of two great historic Jewish figures, the disciples are told again, loud and clear, that Jesus is the one. This is something that cannot be forced upon you. This is something that you must consider and choose for yourself. A lot of our thinking, maybe all of our thinking, happens up here. I want to suggest to you that spiritual decisions, while they certainly can be thought about, we also find the truth of them down in here. There's, there's a knowing that is beyond thinking. Um, there's, there's a knowing that is, that is hard to explain. And we find out what we believe. We choose to believe. We remember what we believe. When we, when we get down, when we get all the brain stuff out of the way and, and we, hear, we hear it in our hearts, I told you last week I was uh, somewhere warm, and, and I, I was, and there was lots of, of water, and it was beautiful. And every, every morning, I sat in a lounge chair, and it was quiet, and the world slowed down. All of my worries about this place, all of my worries about my family, whatever else I think I've got going on, it all slowed down, it came to a stop, and right there in that lounge chair, um, um, on many mornings, I found my soul, and I was thinking about this sermon, and, and right there, uh, um, I felt again this, this witness, this, this, this sense that I, I do choose him, I do believe in him, and I hope you have a quiet place, a place where you can go. You know, if you don't have a place have you ever come in here by yourself? This is a really cool place, to, this, the sanctuary, by yourself. Just come in and sit. I don't know why, but it's wonderful. There's the chapel, there's the prayer wall. Find a place, let the wheels slow down, and find the bottom of your soul. In Psalm 46, the psalmist writes, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come see the works of the Lord, the desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. God is bigger than the tanks. God is bigger than the missiles. God is bigger than the fear and the armies. All the concerns of this earth are broken by the power and the presence of our God. And he asks us to just be quiet. Be still. To listen again. In Jeremiah 29, God calls to his people, you will seek me, 
and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. C.S. Lewis has a famous train of, of logic where he said that Jesus, who is he? He's either a liar or a lunatic or he's Lord. Think of all the things he taught, all the things he said. If you can't write him off as a big liar, look at how he lived. Does he look crazy? If you cannot write him off as a lunatic, then he must be what he said he is. A friend told me last week that train of logic is what pushed him over. It was the tipping point for him that caused him to really choose to be a Christ follower. And I hope for you there is something somewhere that takes you over the tipping point that causes you to choose or choose again this Jesus. Someone once said that all other religions are men and women trying to reach God. But only in Christianity do we find God in a person of Jesus reaching down to man. If he's just a man, then he died. People die all the time. It's what we do. If he's just a man, I don't know how life has meaning or hope. But I want to ask you today, what do you believe? What do you read in the scriptures? How does it speak to you? And I want you to think about these things in your brain. Does it make sense? What you've taught, what you believe in your brain, but I also appeal to you to find the place where you can decide down in the very bottom of your soul. In Romans 8, Paul wrote, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know, this is, it's, it's, it's beyond explanation, but it's something that God does. Somehow, by the Holy Spirit, God speaks to us in ways that don't make sense So may you pray to choose him in your mind, in your heart, in the bottom of your heart. Today, I am proud to tell you that I believe Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Let's pray.